Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. In our previous lecture, we covered um, we covered the uh, theories of consumption up to the relative income hypothesis. We covered um, the absolute income hypothesis, which was propounded by John Maynard Keynes in the 1930s. Uh, which was explored by theorists in the 1950s and the 1960s after discovering uh, what is known as the Kuznets paradox, which started, which started with a, a problem which was discovered by the economist Havelmo. So uh, in our previous installment, we ended our lecture whilst looking at the relative income hypothesis. So we'll resume from that uh, point going forward. So in our previous lecture, we observed that um, we observed that uh, in a bid to resolve the Kuznets paradox, uh, James Tisa and Perry came up with the cross-section version and the time series version. Basically with the cross-section version, a household compares its consumption expenditures or habits, habits, it compares them to those of the subgroup that it perceives itself belonging to. That's the cross-section variant. And then the time series variant or version, the household compares its consumption to the consumption that it attained in the past. So uh, we realized that there was a semi-sociological information which seemed to buttress the conclusions of the relative income hypothesis. Um, so during the recovery, we saw that uh, households, they generally move along the flatter line until they reach their highest attained level of consumption. After recovery, when incomes grow again, they proceed up the long run a consumption function until the next recession. But the main challenge of the relative income hypothesis is that even though it was um, successful in explaining the Kuznets paradox and that intuitive appeal, the main challenge is that it, it is based on interdependent utility functions in which one household's utility or satisfaction depends not only in, on its own consumption activities or patterns, but also on those of other households. This complicates the problem of modeling consumer behavior because consumers or even households, they are assumed to, to be homo economicans. In other words, they make rational decisions as self-contained units, not as interdependent units. Uh, within the economic system. Instead of being able to model each household's behavior um, in isolation, taking as given its income and market prices, one must model all households' consumption decisions together using game theory, the framework has to be game theory because you have got interdependent utility functions. So this assumption made it very difficult to gather empirical evidence to prove or disprove this theory. So although there have been major advances in game theory since the 1950s, the issue of having the consumption motors which are based on utility which is interdependent it was viewed as methodological inconvenience by many theorists. And it violated 
the basic assumption that uh, households or even individual consumers are homo economicus. In other words, they are self-contained rational and maximizing, rational maximizing machines. So that's why the theory was abandoned. So we move on to the life, life cycle model by Franco Motikiane, Albert Andrew, and Richard Brumbeck. The introduction is that two initially distinct theoretical parts that eventually merged into one are the life cycle model developed by Franco Motikiane, Albert Andrew, and Richard Brumbeck in the 1950s and the permanent income hypothesis introduced by Milton Friedman in 1957, because the permanent income hypothesis is a refinement of the life cycle model. Both models emphasize consumption smoothing over time. Let our work short that both could be viewed as, a, as special cases of general intertemporal utility maximization model. Their relationship to one another is somewhat analogous to the Ramsey and Diamond growth models. The life cycle model, like the Diamond overlapping generations model, features a finite life with a distinct period of retirement at the end. The permanent income model, like the Ramsey model, has got infinitely lived or lived consumers. In other words, consumers that live forever or indefinitely. The idea is that the consumption in any period is not the function of current income of that period, but of the whole lifetime expected income. What are the assumptions? Number one, to plan a pattern of consumption expenditure based on expected income in their entire lifetime. This is according to the life cycle hypothesis. The individual maintains a more or less a constant or slightly increasing level of consumption. His level of consumption is limited by his expectation of lifetime income. A typical individual in, within the context of the life cycle model in his early years of life spends on consumption, either by borrowing from others or spending assets that were obtained from the parents as a bequest or as a heritage from the estates of their parents. It is in his main working years of his lifetime that he consumes less than the income he earns and therefore makes net positive savings. He invests these savings in assets that accumulate as wealth, which he consumes in future years, like during retirement. So during retirement, he begins to deserve. That is consumed, consumes more than his income in those later years. So initially there is deserve when the household, when the consumer is building capacity to work and then there is saving when income is greater than whatever needs to be consumed. And then during retirement years from 65 to 75, there is the saving. Basically, there is borrowing for college, buying a home, etc., which means this person is engaged in net deserving. And then when the person gets a job and they get promotion, they start to make a lot of money they'll be saving, paying debt, and then saving for years of retirement. And then whatever was accumulated during the productive years of this person or household is later consumed during retirement. That is uh, between 65 and 75, or whatever upper limit of age, depending on life expectancy. So Motiklian's model emphasized how saving could be used to transfer purchasing power from one stage of life to another. In early life, labor income is usually relatively low to later working years when someone has gathered experience, of course. Income typically peaks in the last part of the working life and then drops at retirement. 
Consumers who wish to smooth consumption would prefer to borrow uh, during the early low income years, repay those loans when they start to make a lot of income and then build wealth when they extinguish those loans during the high income years and then spend off the accrued savings during retirement. That is beyond the uh, 65. Implicit in the life cycle approach is the idea of a lifetime budget constraint. That is first by household. That links consumption at various stages or dates during the lifetime. The slope of the budget constraint, which determines the trade-off between period T, which is current a period consumption, and period T plus one consumption, which is a, a future, an immediate future level of consumption is minus in brackets one plus R. Where R is the real interest rate at which consumers lend and borrow. This is taken from the simple interest formula. The position of the budget constraint depends on the present value of lifetime earnings, which is usually simply called wealth. Just the basic equation for the present value of the lifetime earnings is that the present value is omega with subscript zero, which is equal to A zero, the, uh, the level of income that is independent of the level of interest rate. Like when a person is, is uh, deserving, their parents uh, are accumulated savings. It's not related to the interest rate plus the part which is sensitive to the interest rate, which is a summation of all the lifetime earnings, which is sensitive to the interest rate or what is going on in the banking system. Since when a person is now earning, the, the assumptions that they will be repaying loans and other borrowed monies maybe, which they borrowed when they were lending at college. So naturally their income will be sort of toned down or deflated by, the interest which will be prevailing. Uh, and then we are summing from T equals to zero up to T is equal to T, which is the entire lifetime from the time a person is born to the time a person dies. It's like we are doing uh, that kind of a summation across time in order to get the present value of their lifetime earnings. In other words, we are trying to teach us the aggregate wealth of this person or household. Where Omega with subscript zero is the stock of wealth, human and non-human, as of time zero, A1 is the value of current non-human financial or physical assets, which may be um, assets, you know, bequeathed by the parents to this person. YT, uh, stands for uh, national income or just income from period zero up to period T, which is the expected stream of real labor income over the whole lifetime. And R is the real interest rate. The early empirical test of the life cycle model by Motikliani, Ando, and Bloomberg a test of whether wealth and the interest rate explain the consumption better than current disposable income. Although some successful results were obtained, empirical work was uh, mainly hampered by the difficulty in measuring a stock concept like wealth. Basically, government statisticians are more successful when measuring flow concepts like income, investment, and so on rather than when they measured stock, stocks of assets, which people may falsify or hide elsewhere, or even externalize from any corner. So the criticisms of uh, the life cycle model by Motikliani, Ando, and uh, Prumbeck the, is that wealth is difficult to measure, for instance. And then the flows are easier to measure in general, most economic variables are aggregated in terms of their dollar value. 
Each time a transaction occurs, a dollar value is placed on the goods. Flows by definition involve current transactions and thus have a readily observed current value. Whilst stocks may change hands relatively infrequently, and they, they are generally not easy to, to value. However, for a very large collection of assets, data collectors are forced to either use historic cost, historical cost, the approach taken by accountants, which may drastically underestimate the value of transactions and overestimate the value of such rapidly depreciating assets as computers. So all of these issues, they meant that the wealth as a substitute of, uh, you know, income, disposable income, was not a good determinant of aggregate consumption from a methodological perspective. So we go to the permanent income theory of Milton Friedman. Rather than focusing on the life cycle per se, Milton Friedman discussed in 1957 the general problem faced by households when the income fluctuates over time, whether due to life cycle effects, business cycles, or many other factors that prevail in a normal economy. He considered infinitely lived or infinite lived households and distinguished between a normal level of income that they expect over their lives, which he called permanent income and positive or negative deviations or variations from that permanent level, which he termed transitory income. Similarly, Friedman distinguished the permanent consumption, which is the part of consumption that is planned and steady over time, from unexpected and irregular vacillations or variations in spending, which he termed transitory consumption, such as unexpected medical bills or temporary college tuition expenses, which don't remain over an entire lifetime. Friedman argues that permanent consumption will be proportional to permanent income. Households will plan to spend in an average period, a fraction equal to one or slightly less of their average lifetime income. He further assumed that both permanent and transitory consumption are independent of transitory income because transitory income by its nature is just a record. And that transitory consumption in any period is independent of permanent income because here we're talking about unexpected medical bills or temporary college tuition expenses. So there is no way in which we could have a linear or any other type of uh, definite relationship or defined relationship between transitory consumption and permanent income. Thus, consumption consists of a planned part that depends on permanent consumption and an unplanned part that is totally independent of income. So the planned part, which is um, the planned part, which is permanent consumption, is related to permanent income. Whilst the totally unplanned part is totally independent of income. Transitory consumption can be identified with the random error term in the consumption function regression or ordinary list squares model. The focus of the permanent income model then is the estimation of the relationship between consumption and the measure of permanent income, whatever is being used to proxy permanent income. What are the assumptions? Assumptions. Assumption number one is that consumption is determined by long-term expected income, which is permanent income, rather than the current level of personal income. According to Friedman, an individual who is paid or receives income only once a week, say on Friday, he would not concentrate his consumption on one day with zero consumption on all other days of the week. And so this obviously is intuitively correct reasoning. Basically, an individual would prefer to smooth consumption flow per day rather than plenty of consumption today and little or no consumption tomorrow or on the subsequent days. Thus, consumption in one day is not determined by income received on that particular day. 
permanent income or expected long-term average income is earned from both human and non-human wealth. So the relationship between consumption and permanent income is that permanent consumption a, is a function of um, a, is a function of things like the interest rate, the proportion of non-human wealth to human wealth, and um, one's desire to add to one's wealth, which is represented by you, multiplied by a one's permanent income. In addition to permanent income, the individual's income may contain a transitory component. A transitory income is a temporary income that is not going to persist in the long run. When in the income of an individual increases in the current year, as compared to the last year, the permanent income will be less than the current year's income. This is because the individual is not sure whether the increase in income will persist in the future, and therefore does not immediately revise his estimate of permanent income by the full amount of increase in his income in the current year. So what are the conclusions? Number one, permanent in, the permanent income hypothesis is similar to the life cycle hypothesis and differs only in detail. Permanent income, the permanent income hypothesis is also consistent with the evidence from cross-sectional budget studies that high-income families have low average propensity to consume compared to their low-income counterparts. A sample of high-income families at a given time is likely to con contain a relatively larger number of families who are having positive transitory increase in income. Laying stress on changes in, in the rates of interest and the wealth or assets held by the people and desire to add to one's wealth as important determinants of consumption and saving. Friedman's permanent income hypothesis made a very serious contribution to the theory of consumption and savings. The term real that is used in describing income refers to how your income is affected by inflation. The natural rise in the prices of goods and services, here are just elaborating because there is real and nominal national income. So the other things, the other terms are also defined in the subsequent slides, including the notion of investment. Thank you so much for listening in to uh, this lecture. Thank you so much for listening in to this lecture. Thank you so much for listening to into this lecture. I believe that uh, you benefited. Uh, I will meet you next time when we are exploring um, when we are exploring the ISLM model. Uh, thank you so much for listening in. I believe you benefited from this uh, installment on theories of consumption. Thank you so much.